He doesn't make the wilderness and then scratch his head and say, how am I going to provide for this? Mm -hmm. With the temptation, God also makes a way of escape. Mm -hmm. With the wilderness, God also makes a way of provision and they come like twins. So whatever kind of wilderness you're in, financial, emotional, marital, it doesn't matter what it is, there is a provision in your wilderness. And I want to walk you right to the provision and away from focusing on the problem. You're really talking about wilderness experiences. Is there any time in our lifetime that could be considered more of a wilderness experience <laughs> than 2020, 2021, <laughs> and 2022? I hope okay? not. If it is, I can't remember <laughs> it. I, I can't either. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I wanna say this. Uh, what I got out of your book is wilderness experiences are going to, are either gonna kill you mm -hmm. or they're gonna make you better. You're right. Okay, let me just say something. You look sharp today. Amazing. Okay? Thank so you. if you had to go through this pandemic and come out looking sharp, I, look, you took advantage of whatever situation was de you were dealt. Mm -hmm. And really that's what we're talking about. You can go into a wilderness and die, mm -hmm. or you can go into a wilderness and meet God, mm -hmm. okay? So I feel like that's what I took away from your book. And I wanna hear what you, want us to know about it too. I want to dig a little bit deeper because okay. there are a lot of people that look sharp that don't feel sharp. Yeah. Oh, hey. It is much easier to go out and look sharp mm. yeah. than it is to be sharp, to mm. feel sharp, to have emotional well-being, to be uh, intellectually sound, especially in the kind of wilderness that we are in right now. Yeah. This is not a geographical wilderness where we know uh, the linear footage of how far it is before we get out of it. It is the uncertainty mm -hmm. and living with the ambiguity of an end that leads us into a wilderness, whether you are living in a mansion or living in a trailer on top of a hill, we are all experiencing the same trauma mm -hmm. the same way. What I want people to understand is that when you cannot draw strength, peace, uh, well-being from around you, you must draw it from within you. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to the water in the rock, you have to have the water in your soul. Mm -hmm. Woman, if you believe on me, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly, not your house, not your job, not your country, not your newspaper, mm -hmm. not your community, but out of your own essence shall flow rivers of living water. So in essence, the human soul becomes the rock in the wilderness. Mm. And the rock, there was nothing special about the rock. It was the, the, the God who is living water flowed through the rock and there's nothing special about me but the God who is living water flows through me if I allow him to. If not, I allow my circumstances around me to penetrate what's within me until the dryness around me becomes the dryness within me. You know, I, 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 lo I love you, man. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, lo I love this uh, time. I it's love y'all. It's a sacred, yeah, it's holy, great. beautiful moment every time that we sit down with you. <laughs> but that reminds me of when, and today, Liz, I was listening to this this morning, and you were talking about when, when the flood came. Well, I've read that so many times, but you said that, that it wasn't only the water coming down, the mm. rain coming down, but it came out of the ground. Yes, yes. And that reminds me of what of what happened in Noah's day. It, yeah. it came up out of the ground, out yes. of the belly. Yes. You know. You know what I love about that <laughs> is that when God told Noah it was going to rain, He didn't tell him the whole plan. <laughs> he didn't tell him that He had water up under the earth that He was going to break up the cisterns of the deep. Yeah. And I think it's important for us as believers to know that God has resources yeah. in unexpected on, places. Yes. And when he gets ready to flood you, it's not just the flood that you anticipate coming down from mm -hmm. above. He can break up the cisterns of the deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in order to submerge the earth beneath the water, there were hidden, wa hidden wells of water mm -hmm. that he tapped into. And that's still true. Anybody who dug a well knows there's water underground. For God to break up the water under the ground 
uh, is a very important thing. I was in Africa and we dig wells uh, for indigenous people uh, who have no water. We've done it for years and years and years and years. And it's amazing how many people die with water under their feet, mm. never being able to tap into it. Mm. And if you take the horrific atrocity of what it is like for a human soul to die in the wilderness with a parched mouth and dry lips and eyes roll back in their head and give up the ghosts for the lack of something that is buried right up under their okay. feet. God has blessings and provisions and places that we never anticipated. And I think the whole concept of God's provision is that it comes from the unexpected. Yeah. What, woman, what is in thy house? Mm -hmm. Ah, nothing. I got a pot of oil. He says, go borrow a bunch of vessels. Your nothing is something. Empty vessels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring your emptiness. Bring your emptiness. Yeah. And, and I'm going to fill it up yeah. with what you've been calling nothing because I'm going to cause something to come out of your nothing. Yeah. And, and that's the majesty mm. of, the, of God himself, that he can take the ordinary, mm. that which we have passed over, and bring something substantive out of it. So God's provision is not always about a rich uncle dying or about somebody knocking on your door and, 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 and you're the lucky winner of whatever. It is rethinking what you've been walking past. Wow. And understand that that pot of oil could be more than what you thought it was if you would bring God into it. Okay. Um, do you agree with the statement that you're an esoteric thinker? Yes, pretty much. Okay. Uh, I had to look that word up <laughs> earlier today to make sure that I was, yeah. And I, I consider myself more of a linear thinker, mm -hmm. okay? And so when I read uh, this book, God's Provision, you know, I, I'm wondering if the word wilderness should have been in the title, okay? <laughs> Just, just, for, just for me, simplistic linear thinkers kind of want to know because God's provision for your every need, okay, is, is almost like a hidden uh, title because what you're talking about is where the provision mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. The provision is sometimes in the place that you're cursing and wanting to get out of, okay? Yes. So if you want T.D. Jake's to walk you through the problem that you're facing or the problem you think you're facing or the reality of the problem you're facing, um, go to the number and get the book. This is, this is profound in a lot of ways. And the idea that um, you're, te you're telling me in this book, okay, I'm just telling you what I got out of it. I got out of this you're in a test, you're in a wilderness experience. We're using that as an analogy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and God will meet you there to kill the things that you need killed in your life, mm -hmm. provide for you the things that you need in your life, or you will really basically uh, give up, mm -hmm. wither, I think you said something to the effect of it separates the fakers from the something. I, I don't remember exactly how you say it in the book, but, but some people give up in the wilderness in the place where God is trying to provide provision. Mm -hmm. Is that roughly what we're discussing today? Yes. The, let's go back to this rewind all the way back to let's why go. I didn't put wilderness on the cover. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same reason that Tylenol doesn't put a headache as its logo. Okay. You never put the problem on the cover because nobody's going to reach gonna out. Nobody's going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Good <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> I like you, know, you even more now. Yeah, okay, you know, okay. put cancer on the cover instead of <laughs> chemo. How to self-sacrifice. You know, give me five bottles of cancer, you know. <laughs> so who's going to go to the store and say, give me a lot of wilderness? We oh. do not ask for our wilderness. Oh, our wilderness asks for us. Mm -hmm. We do not get to choose the kinds of wilderness that we face, mm -hmm. whether we're single mothers or going through a divorce or whether we've lost a job or house or whether we find ourselves with some sort of disease. We do not get to pick the wilderness that we confront. Mm 
That is the mystery of life. We do not know it until we're in it. What we do know is that God will be in it with us. Yeah. I, l I, I love where when Jesus comes out of his anonymous years, you know, we hear about him at two, or when he's right, born right, right, at two, right. and then at 12, and yeah, then where yeah. does he go, you know? Yeah. And I love that he comes out, he gets baptized, and then the Holy Spirit takes him into the wilderness. And what I love about that is that Jesus, you know, so we wonder what he was doing all those years. Yes, yes. He, fought, he wanted to go where the Spirit led him. So mm -hmm. he was so willing mm -hmm. to go into the wilderness because the Holy Spirit was there with him. Yes. And I love that about it because we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of it. Oh, you just gave me, I could, I could really take that to town. We should not be afraid of it. We should not be afraid of the wilderness because thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Oh, Yea, okay. though I walk through the valley of the shadow mm. of death, I shall fear no evil for thou art with me. That's absolutely the truth. But I want to talk about the obscurity of the 18 years. And, and, and because we have a lot of people today who are afraid of obscurity. Mm. We have 18 years of nothingness yeah. that we know nothing about Jesus yeah. at all. And people are so afraid of not being known, not yeah. being seen, not being heard, not being acknowledged, not being realized. And they are in a wilderness of obscurity. Mm. But Jesus embraces this 18 years of obscurity and almost savors it, it seems, and, and takes no effort to let us in on this, this wilderness of obscurity until John the Baptist points him out and he's in the crowd then. Mm -hmm. He's not standing out, he's in the crowd. Imagine an audience of people and Jesus is on the back row. He, Jesus is in the balcony. <laughs> you know, Jesus yeah. is in the balcony. John the Baptist is on the stage. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist points up into the balcony and says, behold, the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. Boom, just like that. God snaps him from obscurity to notoriety. Mm -hmm. Just like that, God can move you from, from nowhere to somewhere with such rapid speed that you need not be troubled by the years of being ignored. Right. Because once God moves you to the forefront, you will never be ignored again. So you should savor that time and allow yeah. that time uh, to prepare you because once, once you are famous, you can never be anonymous again. Yeah. You can be infamous, mm. but you can never be anonymous. What it costs you to walk out into the light of God's presence or into the light of jazz or into the light of politics or into the light of entertainment, you never can go back yeah. again. You will always be recognizable. And contrary to popular belief, that's not as good as it sounds. Right. Okay. That is a wilderness all to itself. So we're looking at a wilderness of obscurity. We're looking at a, will, a physical wilderness that he went out to be tempted in. Uh, but we're also looking at a wilderness of notoriety mm -hmm. because notoriety is its own wilderness too. Yeah. Regardless of which wilderness you're in right now, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Whether you're in the wilderness where nobody sees you, mm. where you, you may be in a wilderness where even your own husband or wife doesn't see you. You may be in a wilderness where you're young and wondering, will anybody ever pay you any attention? or whether you're in the wilderness of being literally surrounded by a dry place, an uncertain place, and you're exposed and the Holy Spirit has put you in a place that has compromised your faith and challenged your principles and made you wrestle to survive, or maybe you're in the wilderness of the spotlight because being in the spotlight creates its own kind of loneliness. Whichever wilderness you are in, God is there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. So there's mm -hmm. really nothing um, better than sitting and discussing the goodness of God. True. We're sitting here, we're discussing, in essence, the way God would meet us, the way he would provide for us, the way he loves us constantly. And we think sometimes that the wilderness is because of past sin, because mm -hmm. of he has l overlooked you. You're, and and you're, try, you're, you're trying to redefine 
in essence, where and how God operates in our life. Because I, I remember some, uh, one of the old timers saying it this way, how do, you, how do you know you have faith unless it's called upon? Right. And what is the currency of heaven? It's agape love. How do you get agape love? Testing, trial, you know. So. Let, our, let, me, let me jump in right yeah, there and bet. say the same wilderness that Jesus was tempted in on the other side of the Jordan is the same wilderness that the chariot of fire came and picked up Elijah. Mm. Mm. In the same spot. Mm. I was over in Jerusalem and I went over into Jordan and the first thing I came to realize is right across from Mount Nebo is the wilderness mm -hmm. where Jesus was tempted. But it is also mm -hmm. the same spot where the chariot of fire descended and took away Elijah. Isn't it amazing, the oxymoron, that at one moment it is a place of great test and trial, and the next moment it is a place of great triumph and victory. Mm -hmm. And let us not think that God won't intermix. Sometimes we run from a place, and they say, that was my wilderness. But it also might be in that same place where your chariot of fire comes. Wow. Right. And, and you have to understand that it is only a wilderness for the purpose of God. And when it suits his purpose, he can send a chariot of fire in the same place where your mouth was dry and parched and desperately in need of water and food. Mm -hmm. That same God, he does it in Egypt, the same place that is a place of provision for Israel, also later becomes a place of slavery for Israel so that we don't fall in love with locations we fall in love with God. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, TD, um, I'm sitting here. You realize Paul and Jan used to be sitting here. Okay? Yes. In the 80s. Yes. Uh, you know, you would fly out to Southern California. Yes. And you'd sit with Paul and Jan Crouch and you'd talk about the goodness of God. You've been doing this a long time. Long time, 45 years. And I remember um, my dad, uh, was very involved with an with a old timer who would be a hunt, over a hundred if he was still alive, Paul Bilheimer. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called Destined for the Throne. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Graham wrote the foreword. My dad wrote the introduction for this book, and 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 it's been kind of one of the, let's say, founding principles. The the thought though that aligns with what we're talking about right now is Paul Bilheimer called life on the job training for eternity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our wilderness, and what we mean by wilderness, bad spot, mm -hmm. sickness, uh, can't pay the bills, that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about, a wilderness mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. a, a pandemic, mm -hmm. okay? Loss of a job, being called, uh, what, what was the term that was used for, for, for workers? Unessential. Uh, unessential. Mm -hmm. What if you were just called unessential for, right. you, know, uh, you know, okay. And so this on the job training and sometimes our problems don't make any sense on earth unless you zoom out and include eternity. Absolutely. So really isn't a test, isn't a wilderness supposed to be for your betterment mm -hmm. now and forever in eternity. You know, I'm so glad you said that because a lot of Christians think it's their job to change the environment mm. when many, many times it's the environment's job to change you. Hello. <laughs> and if you, as soon as you understand that, I went to West Virginia, I thought God sent me there to build a church. I later realized that God sent the church to build me. Oh, okay. okay. So I wasn't supposed to build a potter's house in West Virginia. <laughs> the Temple of Faith, which was the name of my church, was supposed to build me so that I could come here and build the potter's house. <laughs> and so a wilderness builds you, whatever wilderness you may be in. And I love the word you use, unessential, mm. because it transcends culture, socioeconomic levels of life. There's not a person in this world who has not dealt with feeling unessential, yeah. wow. whether it's in your marriage, whether it's a child that disrespects you, whether it's a job that disrespects you, whether it's losing a job, or whether you're a midnight waiter at a coffee shop at a truck stop. 
There are moments that we all question our value because we need the affirmation of others to dignify us with the title and acknowledgement. And eventually we must be weaned from the breast milk of human affirmation mm. so that we can eat the manna that falls from heaven and know who we are because that's who God says we are. Mm. Wow. Mm. T.D. Jakes, have you ever at any time in your life ever struggled to pay a bill? <laughs> I would pay a struggle. <laughs> they cut it off. <laughs> okay. So, so you, you, know, uh, you, you know what that is? A lot about it. <laughs> okay. So when did you get to the point and how and what wilderness did you go through that you said that isn't going to happen anymore and it stopped. When did you get rid of that nonsense in your life? When it got through teaching me what God was trying to teach me, there was, it wasn't a lack of his provision, there was a hole in the bucket. Mm. So no matter how much water he poured into it, I would always lose it because I hadn't learned the discipline of how to handle finances. Mm -hmm. And once I finished the course and I finally came to the point that I did not need a miracle for God to provide more, if more wasn't gonna fix it. I needed a miracle for God to teach me to put priorities in the right there places, to live within my means, and then to work my way up. Once he fixed the bucket, then he started pouring in the blessing. Hmm. God is a businessman. He's not gonna invest in a, in, in a company that's bankrupt. One of the strangest scriptures in the Bible is, is where Jesus says, to him that have not will I take away that which he seemeth to have. I thought, oh God, that's brutal. I don't want to <laughs> preach that. I don't want to tell people mm. that if you have not, you're going to take away what they seem to have. And he says, to him that have will I add to that which he has. I said, that sounds so unfair. But it's not unfair at all. God cannot pour great blessings into broken vessels. Wow. It's like trying to love somebody who refuses to be loved. No matter how many times I say I love you, you're still going to walk away and say, yeah, but do you love me? Mm -hmm. And it's not that I didn't say it right. It's that you can't hold it on the inside. Mm -hmm. You have to go to therapy, prayer, class, get on your knees, anoint yourself with all whatever you got to do <laughs> till you fix that hole in you. <laughs> because my, I am tired of saying the same thing 50 times a day, you can't hold it. Uh, and what we have to understand in order to reach that point of inflection, where you say, I'm ready to change, you have to also reach that point of correction so that when you make the change, you can stay changed because more money is not gonna fix bad habits. Mm. When you and I talk about a wilderness, it's an allegory for bad. Mm -hmm. A wilderness experience means you're thirsty and you're hungry mm -hmm. and you're lost you're and you're hot mm -hmm. and you're panicky Parched. and whatever your wilderness is, is causing panic and hyperventilation and all of that kind of stuff. That is what we think about when the word, hey, you're in a wilderness experience. Well, that stinks, okay? But the Hebrew word, uh, doesn't have any kind of a negative connotation, none, mm. zero. It means the place where you would meet God. Wow. See, they were out in the wilderness. That's where God was, mm -mm. okay? Now, it was terrifying, I guess, to the... To the natural, he, to in the, the natural. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. the smoke coming off the mountain and the <laughs> earthquake and the fire and Moses' face was, mm -hmm. you know, glowing and it scared him. And, okay, <laughs> so uh, God's <laughs> presence is something that will get your attention, not in a way that makes you jump around mm -hmm. and wave a flag and be goofy. Mm -hmm. It makes you get down on your face and not want to be burned up is certainly what I feel like the presence of the Lord. So the wilderness experience, though, to the Hebrew world is a place where God is, mm -hmm. okay? How do we get that experience that somebody's living in right now? How do we get them to think, wait a second, T.D. Jakes is trying to explain something. This might be an opportunity for me. How do we... How do we get somebody thinking in the right direction on this thing? I think our first natural, normal inclination 
is get me out of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get me out of this. I don't like this. Get me out of this. When we find out that God does not succumb to our whining and we settle down, then we develop to the second stage. What do you want me to learn from this? Mm -hmm. And when we start getting to that place, now we're getting to the place where I'm open to receive this as, as, a, as a rabbi. Mm -hmm. That the wilderness is my rabbi coming to teach me some, some aspect of God that I have never seen before. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like to think of the wilderness this way. I think that God dated Israel in the wilderness, that wow. they, they had not seen him for 400 years. Mm. And they called on a God that they had not known, served, worshiped, offered up sacrifice to for 400 years. And he said, let my people go that they might worship me. And out there in the wilderness, he dated them. And he showed them his power again. He showed them what he could do. And he I showed them that. how he could heal. And he showed them all of these things. So that by the time they got to the promised land, they were familiar with him. And mm. finally, once the date is over, he circumcised them. Mm. And now they're entering into covenant. They couldn't enter into covenant because they had not, they have been estranged for 400 years. That's 10 generations. They needed to get to know him again. And he proved himself in the wilderness. <laughs> he proved himself at the bitter waters of Mizpah. He proved himself at the brazen serpent that healed their diseases. So that when they got to the point of, of taking the ring of circumcision that pronounced the wedding, they had come to a point in their understanding that they knew who he was. And I, I'm afraid today that we know more about church than we do about God. Mm. We know more about our political parties than we mm. do about God. We know more about what we are not going to stand and we're not going to take and we're not going to do than we do about God. Yeah. We've gotten away from God. We love his music. <laughs> but, but stripped from the music, do you know him? I'm, I'm about to get happy. <laughs> I got to be careful because, you know, I'm still old school. I'm a cross between your generation and your mother and father's generation. So I felt that. I felt that. Hey. Yeah, 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 I felt that. I'm with you all the way. Yeah, yeah, I felt that all the way. Do, do you know him? And there's yeah. nothing like a wilderness yeah. to prove it. The thing that I keep sensing, and I don't know why, but somebody is watching me I'm right now, mm -hmm. and they're listening at you talking, they say, I don't need that book. I don't have, I'm not broke. All my needs are met. I'm doing good. I'm doing fine. I'm doing wonderful. The truth of the matter is you don't have to be broke or without water or have your electricity cut off to be in a wilderness. Come you can now. be a CEO and be in a wilderness yeah. in your heart emotionally, traumatically, maritally. You can be in a, and it's the worst wilderness because there are provisions for poor folks. There are things you can go do and you can go get. There are no provisions for wealthy wilderness. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. You have to be in a secret wilderness. That's why there's so much suicide. Mm -hmm. And I sense through the Holy Spirit that somebody Thank you, Lord. who outwardly looks just fine, inwardly is a wreck. You're ashamed to admit it. You can't tell anybody, no, you get no comfort. Uh, and yet on the inside that you're not in trouble. You're not in trouble. You are in trauma mm -hmm. and it's still a wilderness mm -hmm. and God still loves you and God will still provide for you. If you will humble yourself and admit I'm in a wilderness, I'm in a penthouse suite, but I'm in a wilderness. Mm -hmm. I'm driving a Bentley, but I'm in a wilderness. And if you can open that up before God and say, Lord, I'm in this marriage. I got grandkids. I got kids. I'm in a wilderness. He will come into your wilderness. Jehovah Shammah. Come on now. The Lord is present in your wilderness mm -hmm. and he will be there for you. And I, I, I uncover that because we always think of poor people as mm -hmm. the only ones who have pain. Mm -hmm. But I have learned that powerful people, successful people, rich people, influential people have their own kind of hell and no salve to go upon it. Mm -hmm. But I tell you and I promise you that God sees through all of your artifacts, which incidentally you will all leave here on the earth. You won't take any of it with you. And God knows that you're in a wilderness and he loves you and he'll come where you are.
pray for the folks while we're just in this season right here. In this, in this moment where we have the, the commonality of humanity, all the barriers have been turned down. There are no Republican wilderness and Democratic wilderness and right-wing wilderness, left-wing wilderness, Baptist wilderness, none of Move all of that to the side. I don't care how well your stocks are doing hmm. or whether you just had your water cut off. The one thing we all have in common is pain. Yeah. And we have our wilderness. I want to pray for you that you would see God in your wilderness. Father, in the name of Jesus, Jehovah Shammah, the one who is present in the wilderness, the one who walks in fiery furnaces, the one who stands in between Daniel and the lions, the one the one, the one who cares enough to deal with the trauma that people don't see. While people count the trinkets, God, you know the trauma. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would show up and reveal yourself in the middle of their moment of wilderness. And that you would provide whatever they need, whether it's the little boy in them needing healing or whether it's to be understood or whether it's to open up and release themselves or whether it is to make a decision that would change the trajectory of their lives. We don't want to make another decision without you. I pray for the person who has habits as well as the lack of opportunity. You have habits that even if you got the opportunity, the habits are baked into you, the DNA of how you process finances, resources, jobs, and opportunities. And even if you get a job, you lose it. If you get money, you spend it. I pray that God would patch the hole in your bucket. Thank you, Lord. So that he can fill you to you overflow. Right now, this moment, this second, the Spirit of God invades your darkness My and touches you with His grace. In the name of the Lord, we pray. Mm. Amen and amen. Jesus. So good, Bishop. God's provision for your every need. Oh. I would have called it something about the wilderness, but <laughs> T.D. Jakes knows he more about that. that. <laughs> you, you have like 75 New York Times number one bestsellers, and I'm telling you advice about how to, how to tie. I've never written a book. Okay? No comment. So, exactly. But I, earlier this morning, I was just kind of sitting by myself, and I thought, you know, if I was going to name this book, I would have named something like In the Wilderness, mm -hmm. where withering, waiting, and wanting is. Mm -hmm. but, you're, but it's there you'll find rescue, renewal, and reward. Or... Like wilder blessed. <laughs> wilder blessed. So, don't, no making don't, up words. Don't do yeah. that. Yeah. Don't, don't do don't, that. Don't, don't. That's a little too much like wilder beast, I yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just stick to television. <laughs> you're doing <laughs> great, doing what you're doing. You're doing great, doing Wilder what you're doing. blessed <laughs> wouldn't have been a good title for Wilder this blessed. It, no, 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 no. Wilder blessed sounds like something you put on your hair. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I love you, though. I really do. What I love about the book is it's not so big that busy people don't have time Mono. to read it. I love it, yeah. You know, it's it's small enough that you can get through it and you can use it as a devotional or, or you can read it while you're on the plane or you can read it uh, during a break at work and you can, you can handle it. Sometimes the book is so big, you've gone through a decade by the time you get through mm -hmm. the end of it. It's short, it's powerful, it's potent, it's a capsule, it's medicine, it's life in your wilderness. My goodness. You, ta you talk about <sighs> finding your plan, finding God's plan. Yeah. In the middle of your, how do we do that? Because most of the time, I mean, a lot of people just want to lay down and die. Yeah. Give up. Give up. And you know, in your wilderness, there's a lot of self-sacrifice. Right, 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 right. There's a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't want to feel uh -huh. in a wilderness, you, you know. I'm so glad you asked me. Okay. <laughs> because that opens up a whole nother yeah, sermon. Yeah, okay, go. <laughs> this is one of the reasons we worship. Mm. Because worship wakes you up to the presence of God. Mm. He inhabits the praises of Israel. We think we worship to make the service good. We think we worship because God is, is insecure and he needs us to tell us how great he is. God was God before there was a mouth to tell him he was God. Right. 
We worship to wake ourselves up to our, that we are not just all body, but we are also soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. And if God is going to reveal himself and his purpose, it's going to do it because you are increasingly aware of spiritual nudges. Mm -hmm. How do I get increasingly aware of spiritual nudges, Bishop? I do it through worship. Because with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, I become aware of something outside of the tangible. Mm -hmm. When we do that, we have then touched the GPS through which God guides us from glory to glory. You know, this wilderness thing is God's torturing. He doesn't like me. He's mad at me. He doesn't want me anymore. And that's really just kind of almost 180 degrees wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It's not hard for me. I'm the baby of my family, so that part was easy for me to embrace. When you're the baby of the family and you come up in a healthy family, everybody loved me. So when I got saved, <laughs> yeah, everybody loved me. Everybody loved me. So when I got saved, they told me that God did too. I said, oh, cool, cool, come on in, come on in. <laughs> to accept the favor of God becomes challenging when you've never had the favor of men. Mm. When you've never been celebrated and you've never been appreciated, it's kind of foreign to you to accept the fact that God likes me. Mm. He might not like everything I do, but he loves me. Let's mm. bring it closer. Let's start with he likes me. He loves me. He has loved me with an everlasting love. If you're having trouble receiving that right now, there's something blocking it. Mm. You're not used to opening up to the idea of being preferred. Favor is to be preferred. God prefers you and you didn't earn it and you don't deserve it and you didn't work for it. And that's why it's hard for you to accept it because you know every little silly, stupid thing you ever did in your life, but it's not meritorious. Mm. It is his graciousness, which is made perfect in our weakness. Let's start with the fact He's in love with me. Have you ever had somebody in love with you and you couldn't figure out in the world why and, <laughs> and they were just in love with you? And when you're in love with somebody, you get on the phone with them, run out of words and just breathe. Yeah. You're just on the phone breathing. Nobody thinking nothing to say. Just running up the phone, bill. I'll call my wife, she's long distance. We just be breathing, <laughs> breathing up the rent money. Just breathing. What are you thinking about? I don't know. What are you thinking about? All that stupid stuff, you know. Uh, it's just, just crazy. But, but his love is crazy. He, he just chooses to love us. And that is the glorious gospel yeah. that God so loved the world. Come on now. That he gave his only begotten son. Not God so loved the church. Mm. We don't want to hear this part. It wasn't, the, it wasn't saying that God so loved the church. It said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him, whoso, not just the people that church people like, mm -hmm. whosoever believeth on him, not just the people that your mama like, not just the people that your daddy like, whoso is all of us, mm -hmm. whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe on him? Then believe he loves you. <laughs> if, if you believe on him, believe. I, uh, I, I, I was uh, at a church and, and I listened at a singer sing a, a song and she started singing about, I, I know that you are for me. That's the name of the song. And I started crying. <laughs> I started crying. I couldn't hold back the tears and I came back. I told our music ministry, you gotta learn this song. You gotta learn this song. I just, the, because I have always known that he was for me. Yeah. I have always known I didn't deserve it, but I have always known that God was for me. And if, if you get nothing else out of my book, if you can settle on the fact that God is for you, yeah. even if he has to correct you. My parents would chastise me to, to the living in They'd have been in jail today. <laughs> but, but I never doubted that they were not for me. Mm. I, never, I never doubted that they were not for me. And even though I've been chastened of the Lord, that does not mean that he doesn't love me because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Don't confuse the chastening with malice or hatred. Yeah. Mm. 
God loves you. And if that can sink in the soil of your head right now, healing is coming right now. Thank you, Lord. Restoration is coming right now. Renewal is coming right now. That God isn't trying to make up his mind about you. And if you pay your tithes, he loves you. And if you do this or that, he loves you. And if you, if you fast three weeks, he loves you. No, you're, then you earned it. Mm. He has chosen to love you because he is gracious when we are not graceful. Lead people to Jesus. May I take this opportunity to speak to you? Maybe you've never heard anybody talk like that in all your mm -hmm. life, and you didn't even know that you were eligible to this glorious thing called salvation. Your life is ridden with guilt and shame. Mm. You've done some things, you've seen some things, horrific things, immoral things. You've been in wars and conflicts and seen dead bodies. You've, you've been through all kinds of stuff and they haunt you and you have night terrors and you drink a lot. Hmm. And you can't imagine that a holy God would love a wretch like you. I get it. I'm a wretch too. Hmm. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Accept him into your heart right now. He's waiting. He's anxious. He's so anxious that even though your door is closed, he's knocking on it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will come in and sup with him. He'll come in right now. You're watching in the house, at a truck stop, in your bedroom. Open that door. Open it. He's at it right now, right this minute. Right this minute, Jesus is knocking at the door. He wants to be with you. In that trailer, in that mansion, in that penthouse suite, in that Porsche, mm -hmm. on the bus, in a cab, He wants to be with you. Father, right now I Thank pray you. that hearts would open, mm -hmm. that minds would open, and that the love of Jesus would seep in like water falling on dry ground in the wilderness of sin. God, let your grace seep into that parched soil and bring life where there has been death and bring joy where there has been depression and bring peace where there has been confusion. You've come to bring the gift of eternal life. We accept you now as our personal Savior. Just ask Him. We accept you now as our personal Savior. We invite you to come into our heart. I'm throwing the door wide open. My future is in your hand. 2022 belongs to you. Thank you, Lord. I accept you as Lord of my life. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm. Congratulations. Thank you, Lord. A party just broke out in heaven. The angels are dancing and they just turned up the music and they're going to rock till they drop mm -hmm. because another soul was added to the Thank kingdom you, today. And your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Jesus. Out of your belly, T.D. Jakes, flows rivers of life-giving water. We thank you for what you do, how you do it, how you articulate it. Beautiful. And... Um, and we feel it. We drink of Such the <laughs> life-giving water that Such comes from you. And it's amazing. We love you very much. Thanks for And having. I have to say, you're looking very sharp today. Okay? <laughs> so, I was trying to be like you. I should have wore yellow tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying, it's a great I matched thing. your book really well. You so may, I, yeah, you did match <laughs> okay. my book. Good. Yeah, I was thinking about you. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, for those um, that are wanting that might have tuned in a little late that are wanting to know, do a, a couple of minutes of what you want us to know about this book and what you want to happen for us yeah. by engaging or with Or why it. the wilderness? Yeah. I want you, when you read this book, to understand that God has never made a wilderness for which he did not equally provide a provision. He doesn't make the wilderness and then scratch his head and say, how am I going to provide for this? Mm -hmm. With the temptation, God also makes a way of escape. Mm -hmm. With the wilderness, God also makes a way of provision and they come like twins. 
So whatever kind of wilderness you're in, financial, emotional, marital, it doesn't matter what it is, there is a provision in your wilderness. And I want to walk you right to the provision and away from focusing on the problem. You focus on the problem to the point that it's breaking you down. Now it's time to focus on the provision. And I named it God's provision so you wouldn't focus on the problem. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.